Hi, Jeff Simon here from Social Flight. I'm here with Gary Dyson uh, from Orbis, and we're going to get a very unique tour. It's really loud out here with an APU running for another aircraft. But I'll tell you, this Orbis program is amazing. Mobile eye surgery all over the world from this program in a completely self-contained DC-10. It's really uh, MD-10, excuse me. Really, really amazing. And so, uh, Gary, you're going to give us a tour on the aircraft? Absolutely. Let's, let's all right. Step step. We're going to have to wear masks. This is a hospital. So because of the hospital, we'll do that. But uh, let's get upstairs where it's a little quieter and get started. Oh, that's quieter. <laughs> well, dark in the cockpit, that's for sure. Let me uh, turn some lights on there. There we go. So I have to tell you, this is the first time I've been inside an MD-10 cockpit. <laughs> it's you got you got some space. How many pilots do you fly with uh, during a mission? Well, it only requires two for the MD-10. Okay. But we normally have three or four, uh, depending on the length of the trip. We okay. Long trip, we have extra pilots on board. So for shift changes, right, you generally right. have three or four. And so you don't need a flight engineer on the aircraft. No, right? no, it's all automated right there. Okay. And uh, you know, if somebody sprains an ankle or something, you need another pilot. So it's yep. always good to have an extra. Now you were telling me earlier how many uh, pilots. Well, first of all, tell me a little bit about your background. So you originally came from FedEx, correct? Right. I was, flew around the Air Force for ten years, flew F-15s, and uh, went to FedEx in 1986 and uh, flew 727s, DC-10s, MD-11s there. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, I uh, got involved with Orbis. They needed some help with training because uh, their previous benefactor of uh, United Airlines had stopped flying DC-10s. they got gotten rid of their simulators. So um, their pilots that flew the previous uh, eye hospital, a DC-10, uh, needed a place to train and we were the biggest operators of uh, at FedEx of uh, DC-10s in the world so they called us for help and we were glad to help them. Wow. The relationship between FedEx and Orbis is, is, goes way back to the 80s. Uh, wow. Our chairman and the chairman of uh, Orbis were business associates you know years ago Fred Smith and Al Ulchi and uh, it's it's been in place ever since but now we not only help them with shipping and things but uh, we also fly the airplane. You know one of the things I think that's really fascinating about this is you're you're flying this aircraft into uh, very non-traditional locations I mean you, you have to go to obviously a lot of this is uh, going into third world locations that don't have good medical care that's the point of Orbis right and um, so what's it like going into to places that uh, uh, aren't really I'd say routine in many ways. Well, it's exciting in a way, but it makes you uh, study uh, where you're going and what approach aids they have when you get there and terrain and you just, you have a more heightened sensitivity to the dangers that are out there, you know, mm -hmm. in, in any flight. But uh, it's, it's exciting and, and that's one of the things that appeals to a pilot to come and do this. You get to fly a one-of-a-kind airplane, you go to places you'd never thought of before and uh, you get to be part of uh, such a wonderful mission to to uh, treat and cure uh, avoidable blindness around the world that, that that's been Orbis's uh, mission from the very beginning so. yeah it's it really is amazing amazing what you do what the aircraft's capabilities of uh, it's fantastic and and last question I guess about the aviation side of this is um, I mean, who handles like your flight control or your flight assistance to help um, plan these missions and, and handle the side? Well, uh, uh, I, I'm the chief pilot and I, I take it upon myself to, to flight plan every place that we plan to go, look at all the pitfalls and everything so that the crew, the crew that I assign to that trip, I can pass along all the information I, I can. And then uh, Universal Weather and Aviation down in Houston, uh, they uh, produce our flight plans for us and uh, our Gendex and, and things like that. Uh, provide our NOTAMs and weather for us. Uh, 
So, uh, but we're we're on our own a lot. You yeah. really have to take a lot of it on yourself to make sure that it's safe to go. Now we do have an advanced team that goes and looks at the airport uh, months and months before we ever go there uh, to make sure that the the concrete's stout enough, the runway's long enough, uh, and all those physical things are, are right. sufficient so that we can a, uh, operate safely in, into that airport. Now once once you do land, you're completely self-contained, right? I mean, right. I noticed outside you've got cargo pods, essentially, you know, components that come out from your cargo bay that provide all of your power. And then you even pointed right. out that their fuel is actually hooked up to the wing. Right, it's really important to not have to depend on uh, the local airport or economy to provide you with anything really so uh, we take in enough fuel so that we can burn the fuel out of the wing uh, wing tanks right into the, all the equipment so that we're self-contained wow so it, it's a uh, i wish there were a uh, time lapse video of it going from flight mode and everything's all strapped down and packed inside to hospital mode like it is now uh, because uh, if there's no cargo loader available, and there there isn't in a lot of places, uh, all that has to be pulled out with a forklift, and all that equipment, yeah. and some of it's really heavy, and it, it fits in a very tight hole in the side of the airplane, so it's really something to watch. And our mechanics, we have three mechanics that travel with the airplane, and they, uh, they're they so good and so efficient at getting it done, but it's a, it's a hard day's work. I can't imagine dealing there. with, you know, AOG on an, on an MD-10. <laughs> Time to change a tire, check a few other things. That's, that's, that's amazing. Well, uh, they, they keep it in tip-top shape so that we hopefully don't have any of those right. kind of issues when we go somewhere. And all the pilots are all very experienced on this airplane. They have thousands of hours in it, you know, hundreds of landings. So uh, we only have one, so we have to take right. care of it. Make that's sure amazing. we don't hurt it. Well, uh, just take us on a tour, show. Let's go. Which way? Okay. After you. Let's stop right here. I'll show you some things. Uh, Orbis is a training program. So there are a lot of medical missions in the world that go somewhere and try to do a lot of medical care. And they go and they do as much as they can do and then they leave. But what Orbis has always been trying to do is train. So uh, when we go to a country, uh, it's all been planned in the, in the future. We partner with a local hospital and uh, their doctors have chosen some possible surgery cases that are good for teaching or uh, they're really needed because they're complicated. and uh, instead of just doing as much surgery as we could do we want to teach the locals so that when we leave they can continue the program and yeah uh, if you don't do that uh, they don't want you to leave because right. you know they want to get cared for but this way uh, you teach a man to fish basically and uh, when you leave they can carry on their program when you're there so this is the classroom the surgery that is uh, proceeding in the back will be projected on this 3d tv up here and there'll be uh, as many can fit in here, students that can't fit in the OR can fit in here. And uh, also, uh, they broadcast this over the internet so that someone in a country halfway around the world could be watching the surgery and they can actually text in a question and ask the surgeon. Right. And there'll be a moderator in this classroom with a microphone uh, that can ask the surgeon a question and the surgeon can answer it. Uh, so. I think that that's one of the most, I think, amazing things and something that was a surprise to me about the program. Because when you first think about traveling hospitals or things like that that provide these services, you think about what, what you mentioned, which is, you know, getting the maximum number of surgeries in and, and, it do, and then when you leave, they're stuck. And, and that it, it's so amazing that this is really a teaching hospital, an, uh, an airborne teaching hospital. And I guess your goal is to leave with as many skills left behind as possible to, to, to really uh, improve eye surgery uh, and, and ocular health in the whole, in the whole and, region and that you visit. One reason we partner with a hospital is um, their equipment in their hospital is probably not going to be as sophisticated as maybe what we have here, but we want to teach them on what they have. 
so that they don't have to have fancy stuff. You know, they and sometimes we actually know what they need and bring it and give it to them. Okay. Uh, equipment, things like that. But we don't want to come show off and leave. We want to show them how and. Uh, so you yeah. adapt the techniques and and the work that you're actually doing medically to some degree to the ability and the equipment that exists Absolutely. on the ground. Right, right. And we, we generally go back to the same places every couple of years to see how their program has progressed and, you know, help them keep moving in ahead. Wow. Uh, there, there are countries in Africa that might have one pediatric ophthalmologist in the whole country. Wow. So uh, training and multiplying that is uh, our goal to make the biggest impact we can on avoidable blindness. It, there are about 338 million people in the world that are blind or visually impaired, and about 80% of them don't have to be. All they need is a cataract surgery or some other procedure, and they can see. And that, that's a real crime that there are that many people who have curable situations, conditions, and there's no one to help them. So that's our goal. That, that must be incredibly fulfilling. I mean, the idea, uh, there's so many things in medicine that... Uh, that is, are an uphill battle that you don't that that technology doesn't have the ability to, to right. really change. To think that 80% of an illness across the world could be cured through the, the type of work that Orbis is doing is, is really remarkable. Well, and that's uh, that's why I love to keep doing it. You know, as as a pilot would, all the pilots would want to fly this cool airplane. But uh, when you go on a few programs and you see a little child who can't see on Monday, but they can see on Wednesday and it changes their life. It's like, wow, what an impact wow. this makes. And I'd and then, like to uh, do it again and again. And then en route, this I assume en route is uh, everybody, the transportation for, the, uh, for the everybody staff that's with us. Uh, yep. Most of the volunteer faculty, we call them the doctors, nurses that teach, they just meet us where we're okay. going. But uh, we can carry our staff back here and we designate a couple of flight attendants and everything. It's it's a big family. It's, it's That's really awesome. <laughs> it really must be an incredibly rewarding part of, uh, of your career. And this is Elena. Hi there. Hi, Elena. <laughs> She's the manager of the, of the FEH programs. So wow. She goes with the plane all the time. Last time I saw her was in Ghana about two years ago. We did a program over there, very successful. There's some so Elena, can I talk to you for a quick sure, yeah, So, so what brought you to Orbis? Um, the mission is really incredible, um, and so being able to support a team whose mission is to, um, you know, prevent avoidable blindness is um, just really, um, really incredible, really fulfilling work. Um, I am a public health program manager uh, by education and by expertise, but being able to transfer that work here to Orbis to be able to support um, people who are living all around the world, uh, doctors and nurses, so they can provide care to the uh, to their patients and their communities. It, re it really is so amazing, you know, to go and, and, and travel and implement these projects to, to do that work. And, and w is there one location that really sticks out as probably like maybe the most rewarding or the most interesting? Um, so um, in terms of the teaching and training that we do, I do want to give equal credit to the amazing healthcare teams that we work with all across the world. Um, in terms of the country that I was surprised um, at liking the most, I am a really big fan of Mongolia. I never thought I would find myself there in my lifetime. Um, and so I, it's, um, it really uh, is, it's a breathtaking country um, and, you know, the work that we do there is so incredible um, that it just, it really, it really is one of my favorite places. I encourage everybody to go there if they get a chance to in their lifetime. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Mongolia. So um, where do we go from here? This side, going back. Okay. A little air, airplane information here. All, our car, our, our, all cargo planes have a uh, what's called a 9G net or a, a rigid barrier and that's so that if you stop really quick and the freight tries to move forward it doesn't crush into the cockpit and kill everybody up there. Uh, this is a rigid barrier, it's okay. that thick and because all this stuff back here is technically cargo uh, we have a rigid barrier. We cut a hole in it for a door but that's what that is. Fascinating. So I didn't actually know that about cargo planes, and of course, with all the time you spend in FedEx, so there's some similarities. Right. Most, with, with most all FedEx those. planes have a net, uh, and it, it, if the freight would hit it, it would expand. It comes all, it releases and stops the freight from moving forward any further. But 
the uh, hospital was made up of nine uh, modules that were put in through the uh, cargo door. And everywhere you see one of these blue joints here, okay, that's another unit. It's nine of them in here. Excellent. This is our admin room. Uh, this is real interesting here. Uh, this is uh, the audiovisual uh, IT room, and from that console right there, uh, they can control all the cameras on the airplane. They're all remote control, wow. and broadcast whatever they want on these TVs and that one up there. Uh, and uh, it's a production studio. They can send whatever's here over the internet to whoever wants to watch. I think that's one of the most interesting things that's come up is is how. Uh, how video controlled the entire aircraft is that there's so much with people watching in the essentially the classroom the, uh, uh, there's room down below where people are able to watch it right, goes right. out so video production seems to be a real big part it of the work that you do it certainly is and the fact that that so many people can witness a surgery ask questions uh, the training uh, uh, of that is just amazing wow. and during the time that we haven't been able to do surgery programs during COVID uh, this CyberSci Internet uh, consulting, that, consulting that we do uh, is, is quadrupled because that was how we could operate right. and train while we couldn't fly anywhere. And do these modules move or are these just how they are configured on, on the ground or are these, when you set up, are these already here? Yeah, they're already here. Okay. Nothing in here moves. But okay. interestingly enough, uh, every six years, this all has to come out to do some inspections. Well, of course, you've got, <laughs> you've got the major inspections. So, uh, and later this year, it, it has to come out for the first time. So wow. It'll be uh, very uh, telling. Well, of course, with deep gratitude to all of the companies and, and, uh, and folks that, that keep make this possible. This is the uh, laser, we call it. And Dr. Hunter's in there. He's talked to these people. We'll pass by that and come back. Okay. okay? So in that room, um, there are simulators where doctors can uh, practice cataract surgery on a simulator. And uh, medic medicine has incorporated a lot of simulator technology and technique from the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how much it's, it's taken in. But, We'll go back and see that in a while, but this is the operating room. It's a, this is an accredited hospital. Mm -hmm. That's a positive pressure room to keep the germs out. Um, you'll see the microscope hanging from the ceiling over here, and it's got eyepieces for the surgeon, eyepieces for the, the trainee that's watching the surgery, and a camera so that it can be broadcast up to the TV up there and anywhere else. Uh, but put yourself in the surgeon's shoes. You're looking through a microscope, basically doing microsurgery and answering questions at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> these these folks are good. You know, they really. We've got are. a hand raised from Oklahoma <laughs> asking a question, and one from Sri Lanka. And one of our uh, um, retina uh, doctors, uh, Dr. Steve Charles, world-renowned retina surgeon. Uh, he's a pilot. He's an engineer. I don't know when he sleeps, uh, but he's a retina surgeon, and he designed and has patented on some of this equipment in here. Any, wow. Any eye hospital you go in, half the stuff in there is, is his patent. You know, he's wow. an amazing guy. That's fantastic. What an amazing facility, and I, I love that you can even look in there and, and see so much of it. And during a, a surgery, since everyone's training someone, it gets really crowded in there. There can be as many as 12 people in there because uh, the scrub nurse is training a scrub nurse, the anesthesiologist is training another, and just all around the room. Um, and but that's the goal is to train. So fantastic. Well, welcome back this way. Like any uh, surgery suite, we've got a scrub sink over here and a place for the linens and the instruments to be sterilized. And wow. all that, yep. In the there. autoclave, everything. Oh yeah, up there. it's in there. And on back here uh, is the pre-op in the recovery room. And so before surgery, this is where they come in and anesthetize uh, the patient's eyes. And uh, if it's a if it's a child, they get a bear. <laughs> and uh, the bear goes home with a patch on its eye, just like the, oh, the child does. And that's when they, great. When they come back a day or two later to get the patch off. The bear gets his patch off too. But uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's great to give them something. Uh, and most of them just 
you know, it's, it's their lifetime friend after they get it here, that teddy bear. I can only imagine. I mean, they get their sight back and they have something that represents their experience here at Orbis. Wow. And uh, back in the back, uh, there's a couple of uh, dressing rooms back there. Uh, that door's not usually open on surgery programs, but we open it up for, for tours. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions while we're waiting on our, our turn in the uh, operating room? Well, I mean, so tell me a little bit more about what comes out. We've got a lot of modules that we saw that came out of the aircraft. Um, so tell me a little bit about what's, what's involved in the steps of when, some, when the aircraft lands somewhere. In, you mentioned it's a big, it's a big ordeal. Right. Uh, the lot goes into it. So, what types of systems and what ends up happening that turns this from an, a regular, you know, flying aircraft in, into a ground facility, a ground well, hospital? When we uh, land and taxi in, we'll start our own auxiliary power unit that's in the airplane, and we'll run the air conditioning and power off of that for a few hours while we unload all that equipment that's out next to the airplane there, the generators, the air conditioning units, uh, the chillers. It uh, has a different type of uh, air conditioning system for the hospital. It's actually a, a glycol uh, circulation system. Uh, chillers outside, it circulates through the air handlers on top of these units here, and uh, it works very well. Mm -hmm. uh, but all that has to be pulled out and connected. And depending on, uh, what kind of loading equipment you have. It can take three hours or it can take six hours to mm -hmm. get it all out. But most countries uh, don't have a loader, so you end up using a forklift and uh, hopefully a very skilled operator <laughs> to pull all that stuff out without damaging anything. And uh, it all gets placed on the ground in in a position that it, it it's used to being put in, so everything hooks up correctly. And our mechanics, they know exactly where to put everything, what hooks up to what. And uh, it's just, it's fun watching them and helping them yeah. do all that. Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. So, well, I mean, uh, let's, sounds like we're in good shape for the moving on. Okay, we follow you. Spin around this way. <laughs> How are you doing, Dr. Hunter? I'm good. Let me give you my business card. What are you guys up to? Well, we are learning all about your program and uh, and a little bit about you as well. So yes. tell me a little bit about your. Uh, we might need to come a little closer so we can get the mic to you. Yep. Um, uh, about uh, your experience with Orbis. And, and yeah. So I graduated a residency in ophthalmology in 2005 from Emory. That day, I turned in my pager and flew out to China to join the Orbis plane, meet this guy, and the rest <laughs> is history. So I will tell you, Orbis has always been at the confluence of technology and training, and we've learned so much from aviation. Simulation, checklist, all of that kind of team training, that was new. And I would tell you, aviation's about 40 years ahead of medical training, and so we're learning a lot from Gary and his team. It's, uh, it, it really is fantastic and, and seeing, I, I wasn't aware uh, of, of the amount that, that this is focused on educating yep. other physicians. Absolutely. And, and uh, now Gary also mentioned that to, you, you essentially uh, tailor some of your education to the equipment and abilities that you have at the location you're going to. Absolutely. So we can teach the same, we can teach the same cataract surgery that you're doing in New York City, or we can teach cataract surgery without electricity. And part of that is the planning process. So before we bring this beautiful plane into a country, we do literally a year of planning. So we're matching the technology and the training to what is transferable and sustainable in that country. Wow. And so no, it's, it's really, really cool. And, uh, and, and also I, I uh, heard that there's a, a little bit, if when possible, of trying to bring some of that technology, if there's ability to donate equipment exactly. or things like that, that actually uh, not only leaves the, the country and those medical professionals a little better off in terms of their knowledge, but also perhaps with their equipment. Exactly. You said it better than I could. <laughs> so Gary, well, Gary told you better than I could. Yeah. So, yeah, no, Excellent. thank you guys. I thank really you very much. Yep. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thank you for everything that you do. No, thank you guys. We might as well just exit out the front. Okay, we'll head back out there and uh, 
And before we get out there with the APU, I, w I just want to know a little, little bit more about, you know, your love of flying the MD-10. I mean, you've flown a bunch of, air, of, of aircraft. Where does it sit in your in your heart? Well, um, I'd be lying if I said F-15 wasn't the most favorite plane I ever flew. <laughs> because it, it's hard to argue with that. Hands down. Uh, but for, uh, for this kind of flying in a big airplane with a crew, uh, you just can't beat it, and uh, that's why I've done it for 20 years, and I don't, I don't plan to stop until I can't anymore. You like the adventure so, of going into some of those strips that you wouldn't maybe normally go into. Right, I do, and uh, you know we're never going to do something unsafe because there's only one of these airplanes, and we want to take care of it. But uh, the planning and the preparation, uh, you learn so much from doing that on your own, and uh, you depend on your your crew when you go in there. Uh, we, we work together and it's just a, a real team effort and we know everyone it's like a family excellent so uh, this this is second right after f-15s first, first <laughs> I don't believe it I think there's an f-15 out there for you if you want to go reminisce in the cockpit yeah, I'm sure I, they can work heard, out a tour I heard those guys land earlier exactly I think they, they know it, what they're doing it brings back a lot of memories because it has a very distinctive sound yes <laughs> well thank you so so much for well, everything thank you for the tour good to meet you um, and, uh, you know, we really appreciate it. The work that you do is just amazing, and uh, it's uh, uh, it, it, it's just something to see this up close, to well, see it, and help spread the word to everyone out there uh, in the Social Flight audience. Well, thank you so for again. coming and, and touring, and uh, we love to get the word out on Orbis. Uh, we, we run on donations, so we, know we need people to get on board. So thank you so much, Jeff. Absolutely. So for Social Flight, I'm Jeff Simon. Be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free Social Flight mobile apps for all sorts of other events, destinations, things to do, and more news about what's happening in the world of aviation. Until next time, I wish you all blue skies.